Good morning and welcome to this IFG live event on the UK border after Brexit. Now this has been quite a week for Brexit and we will definitely be discussing some of the recent developments this morning. But the reason we're holding this particularly well-timed event on the border is because it is one of the biggest challenges facing both government and businesses preparing for the end of transition. Whatever happens in the negotiations, deal or no deal, the UK will be leaving the single market and the customs union. Great Britain and the EU will no longer apply the same customs rules or regulations, meaning goods crossing the border between Great Britain and the EU will be subject to customs formalities for the first time in nearly 30 years. From customs declarations to safety and security declarations to hygiene checks on animal and plant products, we will be discussing all of these. The changes are somewhat different in Northern Ireland. The Northern Ireland Protocol agreed as part of the withdrawal agreement at the end of last year was designed to remove the need for border controls on the island of Ireland and in doing so sets out new rules for goods moving from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. The withdrawal agreement left certain decisions about how this will work in practice to the Joint Committee which oversees the application of the withdrawal agreement Although, as we have seen this week, the UK government has indicated it may make some of those decisions unilaterally, potentially breaching international law and receiving quite a clear pushback from the EU. But anyway, preparing for these changes, whatever happens at both the GB EU and GB Northern Ireland border involves a huge amount of work for the government, as well as for those who are trading across them. So just how ready is the UK? What more information does business need and what difference would a deal make? To discuss all these questions and more, I am joined by a fantastic panel. I'm joined by Baroness Burma, Conservative Peer and Chair of the Lords EU Goods Subcommittee. Also joined by William Bain, Policy Advisor to the British Retail Consortium, which represents over 5,000 businesses in the retail sector. I'm also joined by Richard Ballantyne, Chief Executive of the British Ports Association, representing operators who handle 86% of all UK port traffic. And finally, I'm joined by Alex Veach, Head of Public Policy at Logistics UK, formerly the Freight Transport Association, the trade body representing the logistics industry. Before we get going, just to say that this event is on the record and a recording will be available afterwards. Please do tweet along using the hashtag IFGBrexit. Now, as we have so much to cover, I'm going to start with the changes at the GBEU border before moving on to the Northern Ireland Protocol. But please do send in your questions on any of these issues throughout the event using the chat function on your screen, and I will try and get through as many of them as possible. So we'll get going. Um, if I start with the GBEU border, Baroness Verma, your committee has been taking extensive evidence from sectors who are involved in or are concerned about the border after Brexit. Could you summarise sort of what changes are coming on the 1st of January 2021 and what difference a deal with the EU might actually make? Thanks very much, Maddie, for inviting me along. And I thought because you mute me, you unmute me as well. So now I know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think, I think, look, I think we, we recognise two things as a committee. One, um, that there has been a lot of um, worry from small businesses. We've taken evidence from um, um, as a committee um, of the preparedness that they've got to get ready in themselves um, for, for um, coming out in January. The transition period was supposed to get them ready, um, but we, we've still heard a lot of um, evidence to say that they haven't quite understood what preparedness they need to do. Um, but we also know that um, this, under this government, the deal and no deal scenario has narrowed quite a lot. But the outcomes, the outcomes, of course, that everybody wants to wish for is that, that we have a deal um, and that the businesses know what they need to do, do to be ready for those deals, particularly um, I, I think the, those businesses, and there's 150,000 of them, that deal solely with you, um, the EU at this moment in time. And of course, all of the SMEs that um, haven't um, got the facilities themselves to be able to understand what is needed for them to be absolutely prepared um, for, for, the, for a, um, this um, transition period ending and we go into a new world in January where we, we've got to face either being with a deal or a no deal. So I think, you know, the GDP outcomes that the government itself has laid out sort of tells you very clearly that a deal is a far better outcome. Um, but that if there is a no deal, then, you know, uh, unfortunately, COVID happened as well. So we've got a lot of things to contend with at the same time. And I think businesses are having to deal with an awful lot so that the easier and the more 
um, information there is available to businesses, I think the government will be well advised, for, as, as our committee has always said, to, to try and get businesses prepared. Um, the questions, of course, are will, will the borders be ready? And I think that's a bigger question that we may go through um, a little later on. Thanks very much. I mean, Alex, maybe I can bring you in here from the sort of logistics industry perspective. What are the key changes that are, are coming in um, and, and what will that mean in terms of how trade will operate across the GBEU border? OK, thanks. And uh, good morning, everybody. So uh, for the logistics sector, which um, I can be quite general here, we can include uh, ports. And I know Richard uh, Valentine will want to come in on this um, in more detail. Um, hauliers, um, air operators, airports, rail operators, um, you know, and the businesses they serve and intermediaries that kind of flow the data between the, the freight customers and the, and the move, movers of freight. So, you know, there is an awful lot to do. We're focusing with our members who are primarily people who move other people's goods around to adapt to a number of different um, new and um, kind of bespoke systems that they'll need to use from January. So the focus and I suppose the concern is on exports to the EU from um, GB, using my terminology carefully here, GB. <laughs> um, and um, because as everyone will probably be well aware, um, the UK has uh, decided to take a very pragmatic approach and have what they call, the government calls a staged approach to imports. So for the first six months of next year, there'll be far fewer border checks than there would otherwise be. Um, but our friends in the EU have said, right, no, you're, you're, you're in the deep end straight away. First of Jan, full um, rest of world trade procedures um, will apply. So the worry is if um, the uh, business community in totality, so that's retailers, manufacturers, you know, Williams members um, and, and, and others, small SMEs, um, don't provide our members with the right paperwork and our members don't use the systems right, then you're going to have problems. And so we're focusing uh, most of our time now on helping our members understand the uh, UK rules declarations and also importantly helping them understand the uh, the, for, the, the, the EU member states procedures for import controls. And we're focusing on four countries, um, France, Republic of Ireland, Netherlands and Belgium, which are by far the four biggest countries for roll and roll off um, ferries and hauliers. And that's a huge proportion of our EU trade is done by, that, by those means. So each of those four countries is, will have a slightly different system that hauliers uh, and others will have to use um, in addition to the UK systems for export control. And of course, you know, the ports and the ferry community have got to get to grips with all this as well because they're the go-betweens between everybody else. And um, the forwarders and the customs agents have to know all that stuff too because they'll be guiding the, the businesses at the back end about how to do it. And finally, every single business in this country that, that sells goods to any other business or consumer in the European Union has to be ready to, to make to provide the data to make an export declaration from the 1st of January. And, and if they're not, we're going to have problems because um, it will only take a few trucks to have the wrong paperwork for them to be hoinked off to an off-site inspection place, perhaps not even allowed to get to Kent uh, before they even go. So, we, you know, we're doing our best to work with our members to help them get ready as best as we can. Where, you know, we're increasingly nervous is um, how far have the much wider, bigger set of businesses who are actually the importers or the exporters, the retailers, the manufacturers, the traders and all this, how ready are they? And that's not data that we see. We don't have any clear metrics on it ourselves. I'd love to hear from others on the panel on that, because if that if they're not ready, nobody's ready. So back to you. I mean, so you, Logistics UK was one of the organisations that did sign the letter sent last week to Michael Gove, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, sort of raising concerns about government preparedness as well. I was wondering if you can sort of set out what the key concerns are there and almost sort of what, what you want the government to do about it, really, um, to sort of actually to, to, to move things forward. Yes, yeah, so that, that the letter was a, was a wide group of, of stakeholders. Um, I think it's fair to say the the... The, the UK government is working hard if, for the issues that it can control in the logistics sector to, 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 to get things ready. Um, there, I won't go into the detail now, but there are um, four 
IT systems under the UK government control that our members will have to learn to, to use, to know and love. Um, three of them are going okay, two are ready to use. Uh, one's almost ready to use, but it will be phased in. Uh, one of them is behind, and that's the system called Smart Freight, which is um, actually a traffic management control system, um, primarily aimed at reducing uh, traffic jams on the M20 and the M2 in Kent. And so uh, our main issue with that, and the reason we, we wanted to jump on that letter was to say, look, you know, we've been saying this privately for some time. We need this Smart Freight system to be publicly tested much quicker than you're intending to. So we want to pull that forward. I think others um, in the wider logistics community have have concerns um, related to the uptake of uh, training grants for customs agents. Um, we share a concern um, or at least an aspiration that there would be cons uh, enough customs agents to go around. And that's really, really important. So we're looking to see how, you know, from the government, how the uptake has been on that scheme. But we can't deny that the government's been pretty generous in its funding to that sector as well. And so I think, you know, it, it, it is a, a, a mixed picture. Um, the government is doing a lot. Um, and I think we're, we, we're in the space of in that trying to get in that critical friend space. We're saying actually doing a lot of really good stuff. A lot of the IT is going fine, but this smart freight thing, you just need to get a wiggle on, need to hurry up with that one. And actually, I think we, we're seeing now that, that things are, are progressing on, on that side. So it's slightly possibly possibly a slightly more positive picture then. Um, as you've, you've mentioned, Alex, about ports um, and that, you know, that's obviously one of the key parts of this ginormous readiness picture. Um, Richard, uh, if I can bring you in now, I mean, you know, you represent, I think it's 86% of, of operators around um, ports in the UK. I mean, how confident are you that ports have the right information and also enough time to get everything in place that they need to? Um, and again, focusing particularly on GBEU trade for this question. Yes, thank you, Maddie, and good morning, everybody. I am experiencing the dreaded Wi-Fi uh, uh, warning, so if something happens, please do move on, but uh, I'll try as best I can. I think uh, Alex has summarised some of the points very well, uh, particularly if we go back to basics, uh, what we're going to have is four customs controls and other controls that you mentioned, Maddie, and that for content conventional um, port traffic is usually fairly manageable. You know, we have um, experience of handling third country traffic uh, and customs processes and other border information that's submitted to the relevant authority in the UK. But when you factor in the point Alex was making about, uh, I think over half our trade with the European Union is via RORO, so roll on, roll off services, either accompanied services or unaccompanied services. Um, those lorries and their wagons, uh, they're just not designed and, and the freight system is not designed to have interruptions. So if you introduce a new stop at a port for a customs clearance process or some other kind of inspection or approval, you automatically um, run the risk of having congestion and delays. Now, you could say so what, but that means uh, not only is there a lot of congestion potentially around particular ports and routes, but you also add in costs to logistics operators, to Alex's members, to others who want to get their goods as quickly as possible. And it makes us less competitive and less efficient. So the port sector and the freight industry has been used to, um, you know, particularly with the EU borders at least, has been used to uh, no real stoppages other for th otherwise for things like immigration controls and, and a few other things. So this is quite a big cultural change and, and a big expectation which we're being asked to prepare for. And I probably, it's probably fair to say, although we've had four years since the referendum, I hear many people say, we haven't actually known what the arrangements would be, what the requirements will be. Now, we have had some clarity with the last year's election results. And of course, uh, various announcements this year with the government, which have been partly interrupted by the coronavirus pandemic. But now we've got some a clear steer from government and, and I have to commend the HMRC and the border plan, real border protocol and delivery group for the amount of um, effort now they are placing on this. But I would still say it's the clock is ticking and there'll be tight timescales. Now, for, for my sector, what this means is we'll have to have new infrastructure to facilitate these customs and other border controls, either at the port at the frontier or on routes to or from the port. Uh, and as Alex says, there's sort of two dynamics here. One is the import control, the other is, is preparing for export 
arrangements. In terms of imports, ports have a lot more to do with that, of course, because the goods uh, arriving are typically cleared on at or around the port. So uh, we're just now starting to work with government to see what the requirements for infrastructure is. Uh, and indeed, there was some rather technical uh, legislation passed last, last week, which would give automatic planning permission uh, for border control facilities, which we really welcome. And we're just trying to work out whether that um, will be broadened out into ports or whether it just be used for hinterland areas. And also whether we'll have similar um, um, legislation in other parts of the UK, because that was just England. Uh, but we'll come on to Northern Ireland later. Uh, I would say the ports are as prepared as you would expect, and there's been a huge amount of effort. But some of this infrastructure, you know, there's lots of lots of routes. It's not just the the Kent corridor, of course. Lots of routes, and there's, there's lots to do. Uh, and I would say that you know there's a good chance that some of this infrastructure will definitely not be ready, uh, and we do need a some further pragmatic considerations about what we do so that Alex's members and others are not held up in queues, uh, delays, etc., or rerouted to certain routes. But I think it's it's one of these things where we're not used to as a freight and ports and shipping sector, we're not used to governments and policymakers really getting involved uh, in our activities. And obviously you could say this is a, a big democratic exercise, absolutely, those, those arguments are not political today, so those arguments are probably elsewhere. But there is a bit of a consequence of this when government gets involved in things that it wouldn't naturally get involved in. And without sort of uh, getting too um, heated with, with Alex, because we're good friends and good colleagues, I'd say some of the um, IT specifications that the government are introducing, we're broader in favour of now that there's lots to do there. But these IT systems, <laughs> I think if they were more fragmented and separated, I think with, with private providers, we might um, struggle somewhat although there is always that sort of big question mark with the government IT project. Will it be finished and will it be complete on time, completed on time? So broadly speaking, um, we, we're generally supportive of the principles, but we do understand the concerns of the freight agents and others, the software suppliers who, you know, see this as a, a, a direct threat to their opportunities and their business, as well as, you know, um, requiring freight operators to get used to brand new systems completely. So a, a bit more positive uh, sort of uh, on, on the government preparedness side, which I'm sure officials of any officials are watching, they'll be relieved to hear. Uh, just on on the import controls and so sort of the infrastructure that might be needed there, the government, Alex has already mentioned the fact the government is planning on phasing in checks over the next six months for imports. I think there are a few, they're going to be on very specific goods, there will be checks on day one, but most checks, there'll be some coming in, I think next April, and then some sort of full panoply of checks next July. I mean, does that, is that welcome? I mean, does that help your members, uh, Richard, in terms of of preparing for for the the changes at the border? Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, I think it's I think it's vital. And as Alex rightly said, I mean, the real challenge um, in the short term, at least, is going to be for import uh, for export. Sorry, and um, ferries and railroad routes are on back and forth movements with ships going back and forth, back and forth, etc. With the with the busiest routes. Uh, on shorter timescales. So there is a real danger that if there are issues at the other end, say in France or Belgium or the Netherlands or the Republic of Ireland even, there could be, uh, you know, queues and tailbacks of, for the loading of those ferries, which would have an implication for the inbound traffic into the UK. So yes, whilst you sound positive, I'm sort of, uh, you know, cautiously optimistic, but yeah, there's still a lot to do and a long way to go. And if I can just put a sort of a, a quote from, um, I think another sort of a, another industry group that I'm sure you work closely with, um, Richard Burnett, the Road Haulage Association told the Commons Future Relationship Committee, I think on Wednesday, that he thought there'd be an 80% chance of disruption in Kent um, at the end of the year. I mean, do you agree with his assessment? Do you think that's that's fair? Do you, are you a bit more positive? Um, I know I'm slightly putting you on the spot there, but wondered what, what your view is in terms of the disruption in Kent, if, if you know, based on the current timelines we're looking at and preparedness? I think if we're talking about a very sudden, you know, change in operation, then, you know, there could be disruption. But uh, with a bit of pragmatism and a bit of flexibility, I, I think that's, you know, R Richard's another good friend of mine, so I don't want to kind of disagree with him. But I would say it's important to factor in and, and not just concentrate on one particular area. We have about 20 row row ports uh, mm -hmm. up and down the country, um, with links to the EU 
and they all have the same challenges. Yes, the Kent Corridor has a sort of higher stakes because it has more traffic volumes, but we have to deal with the same challenges elsewhere and, you know, maybe scale down slightly, but they, all these technical things as well as um, customs and uh, health controls you mentioned, we've also got safety and security declarations for, for traffic, which is a which is another uh, difficult challenge for, for the industry to overcome. One point I didn't mention earlier, you, uh, just to come back on your original question about the deal versus the uh, no deal, um, I'd be quite quite frank here. I don't think a no deal looks terribly different to my sector than a deal. The, the deal as it is, is already a in, in old money, a very hard Brexit where we have full customs and uh, and health controls and leaving the customs union single market uh, and you know nothing's going to change that we still have that operational challenge now that the, the big difference I guess will be on tariffs but for my sector tariffs are, are not particularly a big thing to to, to worry about unless you're engaged in uh, automobile uh, exports for example to the EU or uh, agricultural products but for mo the most part uh, tariffs are relatively low and they're pence added onto loads and they'll be passed on to us and, uh, as consumers and, and hopefully soaked up in the supplier chain. Now Alex may again be um, kind of saying Richard what are you what are you on about calm down about that but for us it's a fiscal transaction and it's collected away from the border what we're really interested in particularly is, is the actual physical process at yeah. borders that's why I'm probably a bit more relaxed about whether there's a deal or not. That's helpful. I think Alex, you wanted to come in possibly on the disruption in Kent point, but obviously you might you might want to challenge everything that Rich has just said on deal or no deal and what that means for your set. Yes, yeah, so I'm old enough to remember deal or no deal when it was a, just a game show on TV. I don't know if others are, but um, um, uh, so first on the on the you know will there be disruption? I mean that's that's the big you know the big question. I think um, yeah, as I said before, we're doing our best to avoid that by helping our members um, get ready. And so we're sort of converting what Richard rightly described as, a, as an excellent um, deep level of information from HMRC and BPDG and other government departments. And we're pushing it out to members and trying to get them involved and logging into the, the government IT development sandbox, as they call it, and all those good things. Um, all that stuff is going on behind the scenes, right? So um, we're doing our best. Um, and we've got our own checklist of things that we're, we're speaking to government about on a regular basis. But I think the the, the, the real worry is, um, you know, there are about 85,000 VAT registered businesses who trade mostly with the EU. And there's probably the same number again, at least, of smaller non-VAT registered SMEs, single sole traders who also trade mostly with the EU. And what, what worries me personally is, are they ready? And because they're not really our members, we don't have the metrics to, to measure the readiness um, or not. And so I think we're going to be looking to government to to communicate with us what metrics they, they're using to assess trader readiness and are the communications landing. And then of course, comms has to go out to the EU uh, businesses as well who trade without our businesses. So EU businesses, they have to get an EORI number to trade with us. You know, they have to be aware of some of the um, import export controls um, as well. I think the one area I disagree with Richard on about the no deal is the issue about um, access to the EU market for UK hauliers. So people will be forgiven for not knowing this because it's a real kind of inside the inside the bubble thing. But um, if you're not in the EU, you have to use a legal instrument called um, ECMT permits to get permission to travel uh, to the EU. And um, this is the system that's used for trucks from Morocco, Ukraine, um, you know, formerly Russia. I think they're, they're not perhaps involved in it quite so much anymore. But um, you know, you're actually given an, uh, Turkey. So there's a, there's a number of permits given to each of these countries who are party to this multilateral agreement. Um, and there are only so many permits to go around. And the worst cases, and now we, we've looked at this, and the, the 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 worst cases, we're looking at only about one in four UK hauliers being actually allowed to travel to the EU in a given year. And so that does put pressure on um, supply. Um, and that that's something we we are we are really worried about in terms of a no deal and something that would need to be negotiated um, specially to to resolve. 
that's really helpful and so adding another another area of concern to our list in a no deal scenario um so william i'm sorry i haven't brought you in before now but there are definitely lots of questions i have for you as well and um, we've obviously now we've spent a lot of the time talking about uh, what's happening at the border and, and those sort of responsible moving goods across the border but obviously you represent a sector who will be who are sort of you know the ones who want to trade with the eu um i mean alex has raised the question of business readiness and any concerns there i mean what what's your view on sort of readiness within the retail sector for the incoming changes at the GB EU border? Well, it's important to remember that these are the biggest changes in uh, UK EU trading terms for half a century. And it took a period of years to transition to going into the single market. I'm sure there'll be people who remember uh, all of the ad campaigns for being ready for 1993 um, and of course, uh, moving the other way, coming out of the single market, the customs union, the common VAT area, that's been done in a matter of months. Um, so I think the work that's been done by businesses is incredibly impressive to identify the key pinch points, where are going to be the potential liability for tariffs if it is no deal. And I would say for retail, tariffs is going to hit consumers very, very sharply in the pocket. You know, we are talking about billions of extra costs that would be passed on to consumers if we don't get a trade deal by the end of this year. But also in terms of the non-tariff barrier costs, which are entirely new. Um, so business in terms of inbound customs declarations is having to face deadweight costs of seven and a half billion pounds per year, every year, um, as a result of these new processes. Everything is hanging on some new IT systems which are as yet untested. So we don't know how GVMS is going to work. Um, is it going to lead to uh, a, a big reduction in flow through the short straits crossings? Um, and that really is the, the, you know, the arteries by which fresh produce and medicines reach Great Britain. And for our industry and for the expectations that consumers have of being able to buy the widest possible range of fresh produce, in the best possible condition and quality. We are concerned um, that reduced flow through these ports is going to affect both choice and availability for consumers, as well as the unavoidable problems we're gonna have in terms of price and to keep, those, uh, to keep those, those low. We've been working with the government through some technical working groups. We've set them up uh, in conjunction with government to cover VAT, Customs, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, electrical and industrial products, chemicals, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, and also clothing and textiles to come. And that's been a useful way for companies to get the answers. But I think there are still some problems that, that remain. You know, when are we going to get the 10 code reference numbers for commodity codes, uh, which will have to be inserted into companies' um, IT systems? Um, are there going to be enough customs agents that we can, uh, through our intermediaries, be able to get in time? Um, are people aware of the huge changes in VAT that are coming? Uh, you know, import VAT for the first time in 50 years. So there's a huge amount that's being done. You know, I absolutely salute our members for what they're doing. Um, we are getting good feedback uh, from uh, government officials, but it's the scale of what's having to be done in so short a time that is the biggest problem, even with the easements that the UK government have introduced. And if I bring in a question um, that we've got in the Q&A um, from Dr. Evenden Kenyon, the question is, is, is priority being given to just-in-time goods? And I mean, I guess just more broadly, what are the, the key goods that the government is prioritising? And, and are there plans for making sure, for example, food and medicine will get into the country, whatever happens at the ports, if, if things start getting jammed up there? Well, I think the government are saying that, um, you know, things like medicine would be a priority. Um, but of course, we've yet to work out what's happening in terms of the land bridge. I mean, this is all tied up now with the protocol. Uh, and of course, there are indications that trucks from the Republic of Ireland would quite like to have priority because, uh, you know, they're uh, just transiting through Great Britain. Um, and so all of that would have to be worked out in terms of how that would operate at Dover and Folkestone too. So the, the, there are considerable problems there that still have to be sorted in a very short time. 
Could I just ask you just very briefly about um, the government's plans on communicating all of this with business? So they published the border operating model, um, I think it was back in July, um, where sort of there, I mean, there are still some gaps in, in what they set out. Um, they've sort of also launched this sort of broader public campaign, Check Change Go, which I think I've, I've been relatively disparaging about, to be honest. I mean, what, what are their plans for actually trying to make sure businesses are aware of these changes? And do you have confidence that those plans will actually work? I mean, they've talked about a shock and all comms campaign. Do you have any indication of what that will be? And, and do you have confidence that businesses will be able to understand of what, what changes they need to be preparing for? I think we have indications that um, there are going to be new comms uh, campaigns launched soon. Um, but I think there is sometimes the disconnect between the top line messages that people have, making people aware that we are coming out of the customs union single market, but then also the really detailed information that people need if you're operating a custom system within a company or speaking to an intermediary. So I think you need to make sure that you're getting that message right. Now, I think with the system that the retail industry has had with the UK government, having these technical working groups, we at least have conduits to get that really technical information right down to company level. But there are still a vast array of questions that the government's got to answer and we have less than four months to go until some of these processes come online. And in particular, I think there are concerns about some of the IT systems and um, how they will operate for companies on the ground. Baroness Verma, I think you wanted to come in on this point. Yeah, yeah, I did. And I, and I think um, really it was just to uh, reinforce what William was saying, that it isn't really just about just the tariffs. Actually, we, we haven't had I don't think um, from what we get from the evidence we take enough discussion around the non-tariff barriers, you know, the impact they're going to have, particularly, um, you know, the documentation that's come out is there, but, you know, it's a lot of pages to be read by businesses, particularly if you're a small business or a business that's only dealt with the EU in the past. And I think, you know, the, the, the trusted trader schemes and things like that that are there they're fine, but they're very complex for a small business to be able to um, to to navigate around. So I think there needs to be much more information out there is what we're the evidence we're receiving. And as as, as a committee, goods committee, um, you know, it's at, at many levels. But I think the other thing is that, you know, we haven't talked enough about how how we're going to demonstrate, you know, those um, those goods and, and, and services that are linked to rules of origin. You know, I mean, th those bigger debates that whilst, you know, some organisations are doing very well and engaging with the government, the wider, the wider sort of feeling that we've had as a committee is that there is a lot more to be done and that simplification to insist, uh, to assist um, businesses is really needed. And, and you know, and, and William's right, preparedness at the customs, you know, we still know that there is a lot more work to be done and the clock is ticking. Um, so it would be useful to know, you know, what the government's plans are to be able to ensure that, you know, those sort of um, uh, testings on IT structures, um, uh, you know, have actually um, been tested out enough so that suddenly we don't have those blockages at the customs. So that was just it was just to add value to what um, William was saying. Also, just just wondering, um, Baroness Van, you know, what has what has the government's response been to the, the evidence your committee has gathered and, and sort of the reports um, or letters that you've sent? I mean, has there been good engagement and do you feel reassured that the government sort of has it all under control or, or are there concerns from your perspective about what government is doing? No, I think, I think um, generally um, what we find is from the reports that um, the government is minded to um, take, take note of, of the issues that we raise, um, hence why a lot of the um, sort of e extra um, things around customs and, and those concerns are, are being looked at. But, but you know, we all know that um, until we are in a place where we know there's a deal, you know, things are always a moving feast. And I think that's, that's the difficulty for, for most people. Um, be it a trader or, or, or as, as, um, as these trade organisations represent, or those people who have got to see the transit of goods coming in or going out. So I think, I think there is a lot of discussions going on and, and we, we are always grateful 
when um, the government um, does give us a full response. Um, but we are also mindful when they don't, and we then go back and ask more questions. That's the role of the committee, and um, and that's the role for us, we think, to, to hold um, what is being prepared for our country to, to be accounted for. Great. I'm going to ask another question from the Q&A, and this is a sort of question, I guess, to the, to the whole panel, and anyone who, who may be able to answer this or shed light, please feel free to jump in. So Jamie Brown has asked, um, he said that, you know, during COVID, the EU borders allowed priority lanes for food supply chain to ease congestion. And does anyone know whether this is being considered as part of the Brexit border strategy? Um, I don't know if anyone has any uh, knowledge. I don't know, Richard, whether that's something that's being discussed at the ports um, or William, whether you'd know from a sort of retail perspective point. I think um... I think there's been kind of exploration and looking at this, but COVID, although it's really huge sort of sort of event, COVID is the is the different kind of um, issue, because there we're talking about a kind of massive slowdown in demand, and actually you know kind of goods not being held, not being uh, being able to be facilitated because, uh, for example, shipping companies couldn't justify um, having journeys to and from other countries. So that that was that, you know, it's not necessarily a problem about it's securing that supply. It's not making sure it can get through queues. Whereas um, Brexit sort of blockages at borders or, you know, delays and congestion is, is a slightly different kind of arrangement. I think it's been looked at, but it's very difficult to kind of, you know, sort of guarantee um, uh, certain routes or certain freight. Go the government has um, its uh, uh, preferred carrier scheme which is uh, which is essentially a kind of procurement scheme with a number of shipping companies where it can go in at short notice and buy freight capacity on board ferries for example um, and it's got about sort of seven or eight ferry companies in the euro tunnel on that so if they needed to they've got a kind of mechanism there but i come back to the point i made earlier you know you still have to go through a lot of these controls and processes it's not just about kent although that's very important to the country uh, and you still have to undertake these things now one point i would come back and, and, and concede to alex about his point on hauliers is absolutely right you know those permits essential and i wouldn't uh, wish to undermine that particularly but i think where i was coming from is highlighting that the non-tariff barriers i think um, as others have said, haven't perhaps been given quite the, the, the focus or attention that tariffs have. And even I would go further and say, you know, without sort of, um, we want to see future trade deals with other countries as well, of course, we want to increase our trade with the, the rest of the world. But I think we've got to be realistic there, you know, future trade deals with America and others, we're not we're not going to move our geographical location and proximity to European Union and, and continental Europe. The reason we trade so much with them is partly due to things like um, customs easements and other things, but it's probably more to do with sheer proximity and the makeup of our economy, which is an import driven economy. So um, that, that's that's where I'm coming from there. That's great. Does anyone else have any views on whether sort of the plans around the borders from COVID might be able to be used to try and ease um, what's happening with Brexit? If not, I can move on. Or Alex, are you going to no, OK, should we, we, I realise we've only got 20 minutes or so and we haven't got onto one of the big issues, which is the Northern Ireland Protocol. And as I say, very much back in the news this week. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously it's become, uh, it's the focus of a lot of the debate around the UK internal market bill. Um, but if we don't jump straight onto the legislation just yet, um, there, there's obviously quite a lot of political questions around quite what the government is planning there. But I, I think it'd be quite helpful um, to sort of set out what the protocol actually just means for trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, William, I wondered if I can come to you because we know that a lot of retailers do trade across that border. It's quite important there. So what does the Northern Ireland protocol mean for them? Just sort of relatively straightforwardly. Yeah, I mean, effectively, what the protocol does is apply EU rules to trade in goods in Northern Ireland. So it means that uh, all products, whether food or non-food, um, are traded uh, and manufactured in compliance with EU rules, which is, of course, what's going to be applied in the Republic of Ireland as well. So that means you've no regulatory border across the island of Ireland for goods. Uh, the protocol doesn't apply to services, of course. Um, but of course, um, the original iteration of the pro of the protocol uh, had a, a UK-wide customs union, the, the so-called backstop, 
uh, which meant there would be no customs border whatsoever between GB and Northern Ireland. The revised protocol, of course, whilst it keeps Northern Ireland within the UK's customs territory, effectively does have a customs border down the Irish Sea. And so customs declarations have to be made, safety and security declarations have to be made. There's also a regulatory uh, border for food products. So uh, unless we get uh, the deal that we're looking for as an industry uh, from the Commission and the UK government, uh, there would be very costly export health certificates, uh, which would be required as well. And particularly for, for retail, this is, this is system critical. The kinds of costs we're talking about um, in terms of these bureaucratic processes would make the difference between being able to supply the Northern Ireland market as now and for that becoming unviable. Uh, so it is absolutely vital for the retail industry and also for the Northern Ireland consumer that we have this. So the kinds of uh, developments that we've had in the last couple of days, whilst they're certainly not fatal to us getting that type of agreement, it certainly creates a context in which it's more difficult for us to get that agreement. And I think it's the, it's the interest of the Northern Ireland consumer, uh, which has the lowest discretionary spend in the UK, uh, would be the, the hardest hit uh, by uh, lack of availability of product and by new tariffs uh, that have got to be considered here by everyone uh, in this debate. When you're talking about agreement with the EU, you mean sort of over the future relationship, because there are still some sort of questions about process to be ironed out in the joint committee as well. I mean, how concerned are you that some of those decisions won't be made? I think there's sort of a, I mean, again, there's discussion about whether that, that those conversations have broken down and that's why the government's had to or wants to introduce legislation to be able to take decisions unilaterally. But I think there is some discussion about trying to ensure uh, sort of ease of access from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, particularly for supermarkets. Um, I mean, how, how concerned are you about those decisions being reached within the Joint Committee just about that functioning side of it? Well, we, we need to have trust and cordial relations in order to get the kind of agreements that, that we're looking for that ultimately is about meaning that the people of Northern Ireland can get the range of food products that they know and expect at a price uh, that can be delivered to them as well. Um, so we are concerned that um, these developments do put at risk these very delicate discussions, but uh, we think the issue is robust enough uh, and the people of Northern Ireland are um, I think at the forefront of what both sides will do in that joint committee. But yes, the joint committee has to look at which goods are at risk of going into the single market. Uh, and that has to be a joint decision. It's not something which one side is allowed to do unilaterally. Uh, so the EU and the UK must decide that. Um, uh, Michel Barnier and Michael Gove have both said uh, that it is possible for the supermarket industry where the supply chains end in Northern Ireland uh, to have, in a sense, a block exemption from the pay and rebate system on tariffs. We would be uh, urging them very strongly to take that decision in the Joint Committee. But you've also got the specialised committee which effectively implements the rest of the protocol and has to look at these issues like compliance costs from export health certificates, which can cost up to £200 for a single certificate and require to be signed by a vet. And some of the supply of goods that we're talking about here, you know, from supermarkets, lorries going from Scotland over to Northern Ireland, we're talking about four hours potentially uh, between the lorry being made up and the goods going over. And it's very hard to get a lot of this paperwork done in that time scale. And that's why we're looking for some easements from both sides. I think Alex, you wanted to come in, and I, I was going to ask you, um, from your perspective, you know, from the sector, um, what, do do you have? Is there enough information about how all of this will work? What are your big concerns, I guess, in terms of in terms of the functioning of this? And as I say, feel free to come back on on anything that William also mentioned. Oh, thanks, Maddie. I, I I was actually hoping to piggyback on what what William said and and add our shoulder to the wheel because. You know, there are some policy interventions in this area that would be really handy right now. So we're asking through Cabinet Office um, to allow uh, businesses where, who are moving goods from uh, perhaps a distribution centre in GB to a shop in NI, in their, perhaps in their own vehicle, um, to be um, to have a kind of a trusted trader approach where they wouldn't be exempt from all this paperwork, but perhaps a lighter touch 
or fewer bureaucratic requirements could be placed upon them because it seems slightly odd to um, you know, add, as, as William rightly says, that all these cu customs declarations and, and other requirements, if you're moving your own goods from here to there and then selling them to people in Northern Ireland. And we're also talking to them about the plight of the parcel and postal sectors who will have, um, you know, say six, seven, eight thousand individual consignments in a truck and perhaps double that in a plane of postal or small parcel items going to NI from GB. And are we really saying each of those consignments has to be tagged with an individual safety and security declaration? At the moment, the answer is yes, we are really saying that. And we're saying, could this perhaps be simplified in the interests of um, sort of some degree of normal normal trading procedures? So I think where we are fully aligned with the retailers here is, is reducing some of these non-tariff barriers and burdens. Um, that's why I wanted to say, I mean, I think it's it's tricky as of this week, things seem to be moving at some pace in terms of the legal arrangements, uh, which I'm hesitant to sort of dive into. Perhaps others on the panel could speak on that with more authority, but I think, you know, it, it, it does seem to us a, a troubling turn of events this week and some degree of, of a rebuilding of trust is um, seems to be an appropriate course of action uh, on both sides. That, that's fine. I, I will not pr press you any more on, on the developments this week. I mean, just to, to ask a sort of another question about the sort of approach the government is trying to take to ease some of the burdens. They've announced the trader support scheme, um, and I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. I mean, do you think that it will help? Do you think it will be up and running in time? I think they sort of there was a procurement exercise. They've started possibly trying to hire some customs agents to support it. But do you think that, that that's actually going to be in place and be able to help people trading across that that border? Well, I'll just jump in maybe first quickly. We we we, we welcome that. You know, our our, our team in in Northern Ireland were are very supportive, very hopeful for it. And I think the idea is it it um, kind of levels up the playing field to some extent between businesses in NI and importantly actually trading with NI as well, perhaps businesses based in GB who are trading with NI to, you know, uh, create some sort of le level, le more level playing field between them and businesses in GB, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it, we think it's a really helpful initiative, you know, and I think now the proof is in the pudding, isn't it? They just, uh, they just announced the winner of the, of the bid uh, consortium that's going to run that and, um, you know, they, they need, they've got a lot to do. But it does give NI businesses, and as I say, GV businesses trading with NI, it does give them very clear points of contact that's funded and should, the idea of it is that it helps them, handholds, helps them through all these kind of non-tariff barriers that um, William and Richard um, and Baroness have pointed out are are coming along quickly. So I think it's, it is it is a good thing to do and let's, let's just hope they crack on and get it running uh, now. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, Richard, I'm, I'll bring you in, in now too. Um, so on the Ports angle because I think you do have members in Northern Ireland and across the UK. Um, so obviously, who are also going to be um, needing to deal with some of the um, new checks that will be in place for goods crossing between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So the government has acknowledged that there will be expanded infrastructure for some of those checks. How confident are you that that will be in place by the end of the year? And and also, what 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 happens if it's not in place? Uh, what what might we we see? You know, will we also see lots of trucks stacked up like Kent or is it a slightly different question? I think it's a very good question actually and I think Maddie um, realistically I think at some point uh, I think it's fair to say there's so much to do in, in even shorter time scales than for GB to uh, the rest of Europe. I think we're going to have to look at a pragmatic approach with our European colleagues and this joint committee I think at some point will be looking at some sort of phased introduction or easements etc whatever you want to call it because I think the time scales are so short. Um, and, and also it's worth remembering that Northern Ireland and Ireland for, I mean, for many of the, uh, for William and Alex's members, I, I would imagine they see uh, the Republic of Ireland or the island of Ireland uh, and GB as kind of one sort of general kind of freight market uh, of which uh, we're not subject to things like immigration controls even. So lorry drivers don't need to stop for passport checks as they would uh, for goods going from GB to um, uh, Europe, the rest of Europe. So it is quite a, you know, disproportionately, it's quite a dramatic change to have any processes there. Uh, and of course, um, just specifically on Northern Ireland to GB, 
Uh, I think, although not wishing to undermine um, and, and, and over, over um, uh, or kind of question the sensitivities of the Irish land border, I think it's worth pointing out that I think about four times as much trade goes from Northern Ireland to GB as it does from north to south. Uh, but that's, 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 that's just a kind of number, I guess. And there'll be lots of technical kind of issues about whether or not people need to, um, uh, people are moving goods to Northern Ireland and the destination is the, is the south and, and vice versa, etc. So I think all in all, um, I haven't probably given you any list of uh, great solutions there, but I do think um, we, it's, it's so tight timescales. Uh, people are doing a lot of work. There's a lot of officials discussing with ports. There's infrastructure discussions underway now. Um, you know, the best uh, will and intentions are there. But this latest uh, legal um, situation with uh, our, our negotiating partners in the European Union is not particularly helping, I think, the preparations. Although I note from meetings this week with the HMRC, they are at least ploughing on with the plan as is until they have an uh, indication from ministers to deviate somewhat. So uh, we're, we're doing as much as we can there. And on the specifically on the TSSS, or sorry, the TSS, um, I think I agree with Alex. We, we welcome the fact that there will be additional um, additional contacts, uh, costs, sorry, for uh, traders traveling on, a, on effectively a domestic route. So we see this as a good, sensible solution to, uh, to some of those costs, but it's, it's untested, short term scales. And also another legal challenge may be coming from some of the freight agents, the customs agents, et cetera, who provide similar services in, in normal circumstances themselves, which, um, you know, sympathise with them, which is effectively undermining their business. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's there's many, many questions, probably more than there are answers. So I expect if we have this conference in November, December, I expect we'll still be talking about many of these issues. That's, that's interesting. And I, I might bring in Baroness Verma here. I mean, you were talking a bit about, well, the sort of lack of information for traders around GB EU border. And I appreciate that your subcommittee hasn't done quite as much work on Northern Ireland Protocol, but from the sort of uh, parent Lords EU committee that has, I think, done some work. I mean, do you, are you seeing the same issues, you know, in terms of like the government not be, not sharing enough information and not in not enough detail or or do you think it's, it's a different different question in Northern Ireland? No I think I, I think if I come back to it it's not that there's not enough information I think there is information I just think the level of information to be able to be um, disseminated down to everybody to be able to understand and then prepare has been the difficulty and I think as as um, the chair of the EU um, subcommittee for goods I think that's been evident in what we've heard from businesses and trade organisations. On the wider issue that, um, and as a member of the EU Select Committee in the House of Lords, I mean, we, we, we are now going to look at um, the, the recent events. I mean, you know, the, the bill has just been introduced. It'll go for a second reading next week. We'll see what impacts that has in, in the detailed legislation uh, of, of what has been proposed. But it is around two key areas, I think, and, and you know, and I, th I suspect both of them are extremely important to make sure that we don't have a negative impact on UK business, number one, generally GB business, number one, but also to be able to ensure that there are no there are no disadvantage or advantages either either side. So so, you know, from the little detail that I've seen and I haven't actually read the bill yet, I, I you know, I was proposing on reading it yesterday, but um, technology didn't work. But I think I think by and large, it'll be one that, as, as news items have already said, it will take a lot of scrutiny from both houses. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I, you know, I think legislation needs to be scrutinised properly. But, you know, the exit summary declarations is one area of contention. We need to see what that looks like in 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 reality. And state aid, of course, is the second. And again, what does it look like in reality? And I think, if, you know, ultimately what we don't want to do is disadvantage our own businesses, um, given that we are looking for autonomy now that we have left the EU. So, so I think there's a, there's a much wider, much more detailed discussion that's taking place that we won't have access to until we see the bill going through Parliament. 
Yeah, and I'll just say if, if anyone watching hasn't read the bill, the IFG has got a very handy explainer that we wrote on Wednesday on our website if you want to have a look at it. Um, wouldn't be an IFG event if we didn't plug some of our own work. Um, but no, I, I completely uh, take your point, Baroness Verma. I mean, I think that there is obviously a question about whether trying to pass the bill through the House of Commons in two weeks gives quite sufficient time for one, one of the houses to scrutinise it. But I am sure that peers in the House of Lords will definitely be pouring over it. So I think there will be some heated debates to come. I mean, on, on your point actually about sort of will it disadvantage our own businesses, there is a question from the Q&A. Um, and I think maybe I'll ask you, William, um, it's just a question about will the Northern Ireland Protocol mean that the Republic of Ireland will take over more of the retail supply to, to Northern Ireland consumers? I mean, is that a risk that the retailers um, in your, your uh, business group, sorry, your industry group are concerned about? Um, is that something that's the conversation that you've been having? Well, we do have some uh, important members who uh, are prominently based in, in the Republic and uh, they, may, they may wish to service uh, the Northern Ireland stores directly through, through that route. Um, but uh, you have in terms of, uh, of another significant retailer within our membership, you know, the issue about sort of hundreds of trucks per week coming over from Scotland into Northern Ireland. So that is a hugely important artery uh, to deliver goods direct to the Northern Ireland consumer. And we have other members whose uh, supply chain uh, goes through Northern Ireland on the way down to the, the Republic. So these issues really are, 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 are mission critical. But um, I think the key point I would say is um, the extra compliance costs uh, from uh, just applying the protocol without some easements agreed by both sides do present a real material risk to the viability of being able to supply goods, particularly fresh produce for supermarkets uh, from that Scotland to Northern Ireland route. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really critical that uh, both the Commission and the UK government take the action that's necessary to sort this out by the 1st of January, because although we talked about earlier, there are easements for GB to EU customs and other processes that can delay some of this stuff until July. The protocol comes in fully on the 1st of January. On, on those easements points, um, obviously you'll be talking to the UK government as well. I mean, have you, does it, from your conversations, do you feel like the EU will be willing to, to talk about that? Again, the events of this week, I appreciate might undermine some of the goodwill necessary to, to reach agreement around that. But how confident are you that some of those easements might be agreed or are you concerned now? Well, there are concerns that the context that we're now in could damage those very delicate discussions. But I think fundamentally, uh, both the Commission and the UK government have the interests of the people of Northern Ireland at heart. And this is about making sure that we can continue to have the people of Northern Ireland fed with the full range of products that they want to buy at a cost that is going to be viable for both supermarkets and themselves as consumers given that Northern Ireland has the lowest discretionary spend of any part of the UK in terms of incomes. And I think it is the great people of Northern Ireland that could be the difference here to getting some arrangement and a deal over the line that will protect these uh, very fragile supply chains. I realise that we're, we're sort of coming to the end of the event, but I do have one last question, which possibly will be to Alex and Richard. I'm sort of interested, you know, the whole purpose of the Northern, Northern Ireland Protocol is to avoid checks on the island of Ireland. Is there a chance or a risk that Northern Ireland sort of becomes the back door into Great Britain for EU goods if they can cross into Northern Ireland quite straightforwardly? Um, how is there any sense of the government thinking about how to manage that at all? And they say Alex or Richard. <laughs> well, I, I suppose I can I can take one for the team here, Maddie. Um, Great question. Uh, uh, funnily enough, I think the question will normally comes to us the other way around. So are the EU worried about the UK being a backdoor because we might put conceivably lower our tariffs on some products? So that, that's where I th my, my, my impression is the thinking is more the reverse of the way you presented the question because of the thinking about some of the perhaps the trade policy changes that the UK government might might bring in. Um, and I think the other way around could, could uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's actually not something that, that I've come across too much as a concern, but no doubt it's it's somewhere in the sort of government's 
you know, Torah scroll length of worries that they're thinking about at the moment, but certainly to the way round is something I know is, is, is on the EU's mind for sure. Very quickly, Maddie, I'll add, um, I think Make UK, the Manufacturers Association had uh, cited some concerns it has on that specific example. So I think it is, is a kind of a, a genuine feeling. Now, you know, I, I'm ambivalent to this really because I have members uh, who are interested in trade all over the UK and going both ways, etc. Um, but I think it's it's one of those things that Northern Ireland may be more attractive. Uh, for example, I've, I've come across food retailers who are looking at potentially getting the best of both worlds by having sites in Northern Ireland. So I think um, it's probably difficult to predict now, but let's wait and see. OK, great. Well, it is now it is now 11, so I will wrap up um, now. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much to all of our panellists. It was a really fascinating discussion for me. We did get into quite a lot of the nitty gritty detail, um, but I think that it just shows how many different issues are come into play at the border. So there's clearly a lot for government to do and a lot for traders, businesses, hauliers, ports to get done over the next few months. Um, we also will be closely following the progress of the UK internal market bill, what that means for negotiations and what that then may mean for the border. If you would like to listen back, the audio and video will be available shortly on our website where more of these kinds of discussions are, are there as well. Um, and please do check out our IFG explainers on the GBEU border, internal market bill and much, much more. Thank you very much for tuning in and please do join us again for more IFG live discussions. <laughs>